Part 2, Chapter 10 of The Marriage of William Ash by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Part 2, Chapter 10. My lady, it's come! The maid put her head in just to convey the news. Kitty was in her bedroom walking up and down in a fury which was now almost speechless. The housemaid was waiting on the stairs. The butler was waiting in the hall. Till that hurried knock was heard at the front door, and the much-tried Wilson had rushed to open it, the house had been wrapped in a sort of storm of silence. It was ten o'clock on the night of the ball. Half Kitty's costume lay spread out upon her bed. The other half, although since seven o'clock all Kitty's servants had been employed in rushing to Fanchette's establishment in New Bond Street at half our intervals in the fastest hansom to be found, had not yet appeared. However, here at last was the end of despair. A panting boy dragged the box into the hall. The butler and footman carried it upstairs and into their mistress's room, where Kitty, in a white peignoir, stood waiting with the brow of Medea. "'The boy that brought it looked just fit to drop, me lady,' said the maid, as she undid the box. She was a zealous servant, but she was glad sometimes to chasten these great ones of the land by insisting on the seamy side of their pleasures. Kitty paused in the eager task of superintendence, and turned to the under-housemaid, who stood by, gazing open-mouthed at the splendours emerging from the box. "'Run down and tell Wilson to give him some wine and cake,' she said peremptorily. "'It's all Fourchette's fault, odious creature, running it to the last like this, after all her promises.' The housemaid went and soon sped back, for no boy on earth would she have been long defrauded of the sight of her ladyship's completed gown. Did Wilson feed him? Kitty flung her the question as she bent, alternately frowning and jubilant, over the creation before her. Yes, my lady, he was quite a little fellow. He said his legs would just run off his feet, said the girl, growing confused as the moon ray unfolded. Poor wretch, said Kitty carelessly. I'm glad I'm not an errand. Blanche, you know Fourchette may be an old demon, but she has got taste. Just look at these folds and the way she's put on the pearls. Now then, make haste. Off flew the peignoir, and with the help of the excited maids, Kitty slipped into her dress. Ten times over did she declare that it was hopeless, that it didn't fit in the least, that it wasn't one bit what she had ordered, that she couldn't and wouldn't go out in it, that it was simply scandalous, and Fourchette should never be paid a penny. Her maids understood her, and simply went on pulling, patting, fastening, as quickly as their skilled fingers could work, till the last fold fell into its place, and the under-housemaid stepped back with clasped hands and an, Oh, my lady, couched in a note of irrepressible ecstasy. Well, said Kitty, still frowning, eh, Blanche? The maid proper would have scorned to show emotion, but she nodded approval. If you ask me, my lady, I think you've never looked so well in anything. Kitty's brow relaxed at last, as she stood gazing at the reflection in the large glass before her. She saw herself as Artemis, a la Madame de Longueville, in a hunting dress of white silk, descending to the ankles, embroidered from top to toe in crescents of seed pearls and silver, and held at the waist by a silver girdle. Her throat was covered with magnificent pearls, a Tramwell family possession, lent by Lady Tramwell for the occasion. The slim ankles and feet were cased in white silk, cross-guarded with silver and shod with silver sandals. Her belt held her quiver of white-winged arrows, a bow of ivory inlaid with silver was slung at her shoulder, while across her breast the only note of colour in the general harmony of white but a scarf of apple green holding the horn, also of ivory and silver, which, like the belt and bow, had been designed for her in Madame de Longueville's Paris. But neither she nor her model would have been finally content with an adornment so delicately fanciful and minute. Both Kitty and the goddess of the throne knew that they must hold their own in a crowd. For this, there must be diamonds. The sleeves, therefore, on the white arms, fell back from diamond clasps. The ivory spear in her right hand was topped by a small genius with glittering wings, and, in the masses of her fair hair, bound with pearl fillets, shone the large diamond crescent that Lady Tramwell had foreseen, with one small attendant star at either side. The finishing touches. "'Well, upon my word, Kitty,' said a voice from her husband's dressing-room. Kitty turned impetuously. "'Do you like it?' she cried. Ash approached. 
She lifted her horn to her mouth and stood tiptoe. The movement was enchanting. It had in it the youth and freshness of spring woods. It suggested mountain distances and the solitudes of high valleys. Intoxication spoke in Ash's pulses. He wished the maids had been far away that he might have taken the goddess in his very human arms. Instead of which, he stood lazily smiling. What in Dimian are you calling? he asked her. Kitty, you are a dream. Kitty pirouetted, then suddenly stopped short and held out a foot. Look at those silk things, sir. Nobody but Fourchette could have made them look anything but a botch, but they spoiled the dress, and all to please Mother and Mrs. Grundy. I like them. I suppose the nearest you could get to Buskins. You would have preferred ankles au naturel? I don't think you'd have been admitted, Kitty. Shouldn't I? But so few people have feet they can show, sighed Kitty regretfully. Ash's eyes met those of the maid, who was trying to hide her smiles, and he and she both laughed. "'What do you think about it, eh, Blanche?' "'I think her ladyship is much better as she is,' said the maid decidedly. "'She'd have felt very strange when she got there.' Kitty turned upon her like a whirlwind. "'Go to bed,' she said, putting both hands on the shoulders of the maid. "'Go to bed at once. Esther can give you my cloak. "'Do you know, William, she was awake all last night thinking of her brother?' The brother who has had an operation. But I thought there was good news, said Ash kindly. He's much better, put in Kitty. She heard this afternoon. She won't be such a goose as to lie awake, I should hope, tonight. Don't let me catch you here when I get back, she said, releasing the girl, whose eyes had filled with tears. Mr. Ash will help me, and if he pulls the strings into knots, I shall just cut them. So there. Go away, get your supper, and go to bed. Such a lice as I have led them all today. So she threw up her hand in a perfunctory penitence. The maid was forced to go, and the housemaid also returned to the hall with Kitty's opera cloak and fan, till it should please her mistress to descend. Both of them were dead tired, but they took a genuine disinterested pleasure in Kitty's beauty and her fine frocks. She was not by any means always considerate of them, but still, with that wonderful generosity that the poor show every day to the rich, they liked her, and to Ash... Every servant in the house was devoted. Kitty, meanwhile, had driven Ash to his own toilet, and was walking about the room, now studying herself in the glass, and now chattering to him through the open door. "'Have you heard anything more about Tuesday?' she asked him presently. "'Oh, yes, uh, compliments by the dozen. Old Parham overtook me as I was walking away from the house, and said all manner of civil things.' "'And I met Lady Parham in Marshalls,' said Kitty. "'She does thanks so badly.' I should like to show her how to do it. Dear me, Kitty sighed, am I henceforth to live and die on Lady Parham's ample breast? She sat with one foot beating the floor, deep in meditation. And shall I tell you what Mother said? shouted Ash through the door. Yes. He repeated, so far as dressing would let him, a number of the charming and considered phrases in which Lady Tramwell, full of relief, pleasure, and a secret self-reproach, had expressed to him the effect produced upon herself and a select public by Kitty's performance at the Parhams. Kitty had indeed behaved like an angel, an angel en toilette de bal, reciting a scene from Alfred de Musset. Such politeness to Lady Parham, such smiles, sometimes a shade malicious for the Prime Minister, who on his side did his best to efface all memory of his speech of the week before from the mind of his fascinating guest. Smiles from the Princess? applause from the audience, an evening, in fact, all froth and sweet stuff, from which Lady Parham emerged grimly content, conscious at the same time that she was henceforward very decidedly, and rather disagreeably, in the ashes' debt, while Elizabeth Tranmore went home in a tremor of delight, happily persuaded that ashes' path was now clear. Kitty listened, sometimes pleased, sometimes inclined to be critical or scornful, of her mother-in-law's praise. But she did love Lady Tranmore, and on the whole she smiled. Smiles indeed had been Kitty's portion since that evening of strange emotion, when she found herself sobbing in William's arms for reasons quite beyond her own defining. It was as if, like the prince in the fairy tale, some iron band round her heart had given way. She seemed to dance through the house. She devoured her child with kisses, she was even willing sometimes to let William tell her what his mother suspected of the progress of Mary's affair with Geoffrey Cliff, 
though she carefully avoided speaking directly to Lady Tramwell about it. As to Cliff himself, she seemed to have dropped him out of her thoughts. She never mentioned him, and Ash could only suppose she had found him disenchanting. Well, darling, I hope I have made a sufficient fool of myself to please you. Ash had thrown the door wide, and stood on the threshold, arrayed in the brocade and fur of a Venetian noble. He was a somewhat magnificent apparition, and Kitty, who had coaxed or driven him into the dress, gave a scream of delight. She saw him before her own glass, and the crimson senator made eyes at the white goddess as they posed triumphantly together. "'You're a very rococo sort of goddess, you know, Kitty,' said Gash. "'Not much Greek about you.' "'Quite as much as I want, thank you,' said Kitty, curtsying to her own reflection in the glass. "'Fonchette could have taught them a thing or two. "'Now come along. Uh, I'll wait.' And, gathering up her possessions, she left the room. Ash, following her, saw that she was going to the nursery, a large room on the back staircase. At the threshold she turned back and put her finger to her lip. Then she slipped in, reappearing a moment afterwards to say in a whisper, Nurse is not in bed. You may come in. Nurse indeed knew much better than to be in bed. She'd been sitting up to see her ladyship's splendours. Then she rose, smiling, as Ash entered the room. A parcel of idiots, nurse, aren't we? he said, as he too displayed himself and then he followed Kitty to the child's bedside. She bent over the baby, removed a corner of the cot blanket that might tease his cheek, touched the mottled hand softly, removed a light that seemed to her too near, and still stood looking. We must go, Kitty. I wish he were a little older, she said discontentedly under her breath, that he might wake up and see us both. I should like him to remember me like this. Queen and Huntress, come away, said Ash, drawing her by the hand. Outside, the landing was dimly lighted. The servants were all waiting in the hall below. Kitty, said Ash passionately, give me one kiss. It was so sweet tonight, so sweet. She turned. Take care of my dress, she smiled. And then she held out her face under its sparkling crescent, held it with a dainty deliberation, and let her lips cling to his. Ash and Kitty were soon wedged into one of the interminable lines of carriages that blocked all the approaches to St James's Square. The ball had been long expected, and there was a crowd in the streets, kept back by the police. The broom went at a foot's pace, and there was ample time either for reverie or conversation. Kitty looked out incessantly, exclaiming when she caught sight of a costume or an acquaintance. Ash had time to think over the latest phase of the negotiations with America, and to go over in his mind the sentences of a letter he had addressed to the Times in answer to one of great violence from Geoffrey Cliff. His own letter had appeared that morning. Ash was proud of it. He made bold to think that it exposed Cliff's exaggerations and insincerities neatly, and perhaps decisively. At any rate, he hummed a cheerful tune as he thought of it. Then suddenly and incongruously a recollection occurred to him. Kitty, do you know that I had a letter from your mother this morning? Had you? said Kitty, turning to him with reluctance. I suppose she wanted some money. She did. She says she's very hard up. If I cared to use it, I'd have an easy reply. What do you mean? I might say, damn it, we are too. Kitty laughed uneasily. Don't begin to talk money matters now, William, please. No, dear, I won't, but we shall really have to draw in. You will pay so many debts, said Kitty, frowning. Ash went into a fit of laughter. <laughs> That's my extravagance, is it? I assure you I go on the most approved principles. I divide our available money among the greatest number of hungry claimants it will stretch to. But after all, it goes a beggarly short way. I know Mother will think my diamond crescent a horrible extravagance, said Kitty, pouting. But you are the only son, William, and we must behave like other people. Dear, yeah, don't trouble your little head, he said. I'll manage it somehow. Indeed, he knew very well that he could never bring his own indolent and easy-going temper in such matters to face any real struggle with Kitty over money. He must go to his mother, who now, his father being a hopeless invalid, managed the estates with his own and the agent's help. It was, of course, right that she should preach to Kitty a little. 
but she would be sensible and help them out. After all, there was plenty of money. Why shouldn't Kitty spend it? Anyone who knew him well might have observed a curious contrast between his private laxity in these matters and the strictness of his public practice. He was a scruple and delicacy itself in all financial matters that touched his public life, directorships, investments and the like, no less in all that concerned interest and patronage. He would have been a bold man who had dared to propose to William Ash any expedient whatever by which his public place might serve his private gain. His proud and fastidious integrity, indeed, was one of the sources of his growing power. But as to private debts, and the tradesmen to whom they were owed, his standards were still essentially those of the Whigs from whom he descended, of Fox, the all indebted, or of Melbourne, who was left an amusing disquisition on the art of dividing a few loaves and fishes in the shape of banknotes among a multitude of creditors. Not that affairs were as yet very bad, far from it, but there was little to spare for Madame Destre, who ought indeed to want nothing. And Ash was vaguely meditating his reply to that lady, when a face in a carriage near them which was trying to enter the line caught his attention. Mary, he said, I'll ask Joshua, and Mother. They don't see us. Query, will Cliff take the leap tonight? Mother reports a decided increase of ardour on his part. Sorry you don't approve of it, darling. It's just like lighting a lamp to put it out, that's all, said Kitty with vivacity. The man who marries Mary is done for. Not at all. Mary's money will give him the pedestal he wants, and trust Cliff to take care of his own individuality afterwards. Now, if you'll transfer your alarms to Mary, I'm with you. Oh, of course you'll be unkind to her. She may lay her account for that, but it's the marrying her. And Kitty's upper lip curled under a slow disdain. William laughed out. Kitty, really? You remind me, please, of Miss Jane Taylor. I did not think there could be found a little heart so hard. Mary's thirty. She would like to be married. And why not? She'll give quite as good as she gets. Well, she won't get anything. Geoffrey Cliff thinks of no one but himself. Ash's eyebrows went up. Oh, well, all men are selfish, and the women don't mind. Depends on how it's done, said Kitty. Ash declared that Cliff was just an ordinary person, non sensuel moyen, with a touch of genius. Except for that, no better and no worse than other people. What then? The world was not made up of persons of enormous virtue like all Lord Althrop and Mr. Gladstone. If Mary wanted him for a husband, and could catch him, both, in his opinion, would have pretty nearly got their deserts. Kitty, however, fell into a reverie, after which she let him see a face of the same startling sweetness as she had several times shown him of late. Do you want me to be nice to her? She nestled up to him. Bind her to your chariot wheels, madam. You can said Ash, slipping a hand round hers. Kitty pondered. Well, then, I won't tell her that I know he's still in love with the French woman, but it's on the tip of my tongue. Heavens, cried Ash. The Vicomtesse, the lady of the poems, but she's dead. I thought that was over long ago. Kitty was silent for a moment, then said with low-voiced emphasis, that anyone could write those poems and then think of Mary. Yes, the poems were fine, said Ash but make-believe. Kitty protested indignantly. Ash bantered her a little on being one of the women who were the making of Cliff. Say what you like, she said, drawing a quick breath, but often and often he says divine things, divinely. I feel them there. And she lifted both hands to her breast with an impassive gesture. Goddess, said Ash, kissing her hand because enthusiasm became her so well. And to think that I should have dared to roast the Divine One in a Times letter this morning. The hall and staircase of Yorkshire House were already filled with a motley and magnificent crowd when Ash and Kitty arrived. Kitty, still shrouded in her cloak, pushed her way through, exchanging greetings with friends, shrieking a little now and then for the safety of her bow and quiver, her face flushed with pleasure and excitement. Then she disappeared into the cloakroom, and Ash was left to wonder how he was going to endure his robes through the heat of the evening, and to exchange a laughing remark or two with the parliamentary secretary to the Admiralty 
into whose company he had fallen. "'What are we doing it for?' he asked the young man, whose thin person was well set off by a Tudor dress. "'Oh, don't be superior,' said the other. "'I'm going to enjoy myself like a schoolboy.' And that, indeed, seemed to be the attitude of most of the people present, and not only of the younger members of the dazzling company. What struck Ash particularly, as he mingled with the crowd, was the alacrity of the elder men. Here was a famous lawyer, already nearing the seventies, in the Lord Chancellor's garb of a great ancestor. Here, an ex-viceroy of Ireland, with a son in the government, magnificent in an Elizabethan dress, his fair bushy hair and reddish beard shining above a doublet on which glittered a jewel given to the founder of his house by Elizabeth's own hand. Next to him, a white-haired judge in the robes of Judge Gashcoin, a peer no younger at his side in the red and blue of Mazarin, and, showing each and all in their gay, complacent looks, a clear revival of that former masculine delight in splendid clothes which came so strangely to an end with that older world on the ruins of which Napoleon rose. So with the elder women, for this night they were young again. They had been free to choose from all the ages a dress that suited them, and the result of this renewal of a long-relinquished eagerness had been in many cases to call back a bygone self, and the tones and gestures of those years when beauty did its own chief care. As for the young men, the young women, and the girls, the zest and pleasure of the show shone in their eyes and movements and spread through the hall and up the crowded staircase like a warm, contagious atmosphere. At all times, indeed, and in all countries, an aristocracy has been capable of this sheer delight in its own splendour, wealth, good looks, and accumulated treasure. Whether in the Venice that Petrarch visited, or in the Rome of Renaissance popes, in the Versailles of the Grand Monarch, or in the Florence of today, which still, at moments of festa, reproduces in its midst, all the costumes of the Cinquecento. In this English case, there was less dignity than there would have been in a Latin country, a more personal beauty, less grace perhaps, and yet a something richer and more romantic. At the top of the stairs stood a Marquis in the dress of an Italian Renaissance, the Gonzaga, which sat with Titian. Beside him, a fair-haired wife in the white satin and pearls of Henrietta Maria, while up the marble stairs watched by a laughing multitude above, streamed Gainsborough girls and Reynolds women, women from the courts of Elizabeth, or Henri Quatre, of Marie Theresa, or Marie Antoinette, the figures of Holbein and Van Dyck, Florentines of the Renaissance, the use of Carpaccio, the beauties of Titian and Veronese. "'Kitty, make haste!' cried a voice in front as Hitty began to mount the stairs. "'Your quadrille is just called!' Kitty smiled and nodded but did not hurry her pace by a second. The staircase was not so full as it had been, and she knew well as she mounted it, her slender figure drawn to its full height, her eyes flashing greeting and challenge to those in the gallery, the diamond genius on her spare glittering above her, that she held the stage, and that the play would not begin without her. And indeed, her dress, her brilliance, and her beauty let loose a hum of conversation not always friendly. What is she? Oh, something mythological. She's in the next quadrille. My dear, she's Diana. Look at her bow and quiver and the moon in her hair. Very incorrect. She ought to have the towered crown. Absurd, such a little thing to attempt Diana. I'd back Actaeon. The latter remark was spoken in the ear of Louis Harmon, who stood in the gallery looking down. But Harmon shook his head. You don't understand. She's not Greek, of course, but she's fairyland. Child of the Renaissance, dreamy in a wood, would have seen Artemis so, dressed up and glittering and fantastic, as the Florentines saw Venus. Small, too, like the fairies, slipping through the leaves, small hands with jewelled collars following her. He smiled at his own fancy, still watching Kitty with his painter's eyes. She has seen a French print somewhere, said Cliff, who stood close by. More Versailles in it than Fairyland, I think. It is she that is Fairyland, said Harmon, still fascinated. Cliff's expression showed the sarcasm of his thought. Fairy, perhaps, with a touch of malice and inhuman mischiefs that all tradition attributes to the little people. 
Why, after that first meeting, when the conversation of a few minutes had almost swept them into the deepest waters of intimacy, had she slighted him so, in other drawing-rooms and on other occasions? She had actually neglected and avoided him, after having dared to speak of him of his secret. And now Ash's letter of the morning had kindled afresh his sense of rancour against a pair of people too prosperous and too arrogant. The stroke in the Times had, he knew, gone home. His vanity writhed under it, and the wish to strike back tormented him as he watched Ash mounting behind his wife, so handsome, careless and urbane, his jewelled cap dangling in his hand. The quadrille of gods and goddesses was over. Kitty had been dancing with a fine, clumsy Mars, in ordinary life an honest soldier and deer-stalker, the heir to a Scotch dukedom. Having as her vis-a-vis Madeleine Orcott, as the flora of Botticelli's spring, and slim as Mercury in fantastic Renaissance armour. All the divinities of the Pantheon, indeed, were there, but in Gallicized or Italianite form, scarcely a touch of the true antique, save in the case of one beautiful girl who wore a Juno dress of white, whereof the clinging folds had been arranged for her by a young Netherlands painter, Mr. Alma Tadema, then newly settled in this country. Kitty at first envied her, then decided that she herself could have made no effect in such a gown, and threw her the praises of indifference. When, to Kitty's sharp regret, the music stopped and the glittering crew of immortals melted into the crowd, she found behind her a row of dancers waiting for the quadrille which was to follow. This was to consist entirely of English pictures revived, Reynolds, Gainsborough and Romney, and to be danced by those for whose families they had been originally painted. As she drew back, looking eagerly to right and left, she came across Mary Lister. Mary wore her hair high and powdered, a black silk scarf over white satin and a blue sash. Awfully becoming, said Kitty, nodding to her. Who are you? My great-great-aunt, said Mary, curtsying. You see, I go even further back. Isn't it fun? said Kitty, pausing beside her. Have you seen William? Poor dear, he's so hot. How do you do? This last careless greeting was addressed to Cliff, whom she now perceived standing behind Mary. Cliff bowed stiffly. Excuse me, I did not see you. I was absorbed in your dress. You are Artemis, I see, with additions. Oh, I am an article de Paris, said Kitty. But it seems odd that some people should take me for Joan of Arc. Then she turns to Mary. I think your dress is quite lovely, she said in that warm, shy voice she rarely used except for a few intimates and had never yet been known to waste on Mary. Don't you admire it enormously, Mr. Cliff? Enormously, said Cliff, pulling at his moustache. But by now my compliments are stale. Is he cross about William's letter? thought Kitty. Well, let's leave them to themselves. Then, as she passed him, something in the silent personality of the man arrested her. She could not forbear to look at him over her shoulder. Are you? Oh, of course I remember. For she had recognised the dress and cap of the Spanish grandee. Cliff did not reply for a moment, but the harsh significance of his face revived in her the excitable interest she had felt in him on the day of his luncheon in Hill Street an interest since effaced and dispersed under the influence of that serenity and home peace which had shone upon her since that very day. "'I should apologise, no doubt, for not taking your advice,' he said, looking her in the eyes. Their expression, half bitter, half insolent, reminded her. "'Did I give you any advice?' Kitty wrinkled up her white brows. "'I don't recollect.' Mary looked at her sharply, suspiciously. Kitty, quite conscious of the look, was straightway pricked by an elfish curiosity. Could she carry him off, trouble Mary's possession then and there? She believed she could. She was well aware of a certain relation between herself and Cliff, if at least she chose to develop it. Should she? Her vanity insisted that Mary could not prevent it. However, she restrained herself and moved on. Presently, looking back, she saw them still together, Cliff leaning against the pedestal of a bust, Mary beside him. There was an animation in her eyes, a rose of pleasure on her cheek, which stirred in Kitty a queer, sudden sympathy. I am a little beast, she said to herself. 
Why shouldn't she be happy? Then, perceiving Lady Tranmore at the end of the ballroom, she made her way thither, surrounded by a motley crowd of friends. She walked as though on air, reigning influence. And as Lady Tranmore caught the glitter of the diamond crescent and beheld the small divinity beneath it, she too smiled with pleasure, like the other spectators on Kitty's march. The dress was monstrously costly. She knew that. But she forgot the inroad on William's pocket, and remembered only to be proud of William's wife. Since the Parham's party, indeed, the unlooked-for submission of Kitty and the clearing of William's prospects, Lady Tranmore had been sweetness itself to her daughter-in-law. But her fine face and brow were nonetheless inclined to frown. She herself, as Catherine of Aragon, would have shed a dignity on any scene, but she was in no sympathy with what she beheld. We shall soon all of us be ashamed of this kind of thing, she declared to Kitty, just as people now are beginning to be ashamed of enormous houses and troops of servants. No, please, only bored with them, said Kitty. There are so many other ways now of amusing yourself, that's all. Well, this way will die out, said Lady Tranmore. The cost of it is too scandalous. People's consciences prick them. Kitty vowed she did not believe there was a conscience in the room. And then, as the music struck up, she carried off her companion to some steps overlooking the great marble gallery, where they had a better view of the two lines of dancers. It is said that, as a nation, the English have no gift for pageants. Yet every now and then, as no doubt in the Elizabethan mask, they show a strange felicity in the art. Certainly the dance that followed would have been difficult to surpass, even in the ripe days of motherlands of pageantry. To the left, a long line, consisting mainly of young girls in their first bloom, dressed as Gainsborough and his great contemporaries delighted to paint these flowers of England. The folds of plain white muslin crossed over the young breast, a black velvet at the throat, a rose in the hair, the simple skirt showing the small pointed feet, and sometimes a broad sash defining the slender waist. Here were Stanleys, Howards, Percys, Villerses, Butlers, Osbornes, soft slips of girls bearing the names of England's rough and turbulent youth, bearing themselves tonight with a shy or laughing dignity, as though the touch of history and romance were on them. And facing them, the youths of the same families, no less handsome than their sisters and brides, in Romney's blue coats, or the splendid reds of Reynolds and Gainsborough. To and fro swayed the dancers, under the innumerable candles that filled the arched roof and upper walls of the ballroom. And each time the lines parted, they disclosed at the farther end another pageant, to which that of the dance was in truth subordinate. A dais hung with blue and silver, and upon it a royal lady, whose beauty, then in its first bloom, had been a national possession, since, as the sea king's daughter, she brought it in diary to her adopted country. Tonight she blazed in jewels as a Valois queen, with her court around her, and as the dances receded, each youth and maiden seemed instinctively to turn towards her as roses to the sun. Oh, beautiful, beautiful world, said Kitty to herself in an ecstasy, pressing her small hands together. How I love you, love you. Meanwhile, Darrell and Harmon stood side by side near the doorway of the ballroom, looking in when the crowd allowed. Strange sight, said Harmon. Perhaps they take it too seriously. Ah, that is our English upper class, said Darrell with a sneer. Is there anything they take lightly, par exemple? <laughs> it seems to me they carry off this amusement better than most. They may be stupid, but they are good-looking. I say, Ash, he turned towards the newcomer who had just sorted up to them. On this exceptional occasion, it is allowed to congratulate you on Lady Kitty's gown? For Kitty, raised upon her step, was at the moment in full view. Ash made some slight reply, the slightest of which indeed annoyed the thin-skinned and morbid Darrell, always on the lookout for affronts. But Louis Harmon, who happened to observe the Undersecretary's glance at his wife, said to himself, By George, that queer marriage is turning out well, after all. Tudor and Marie Antoinette quadrilles had been danced. There was a rumour of supper in the air. William, 
said Kitty in his ear as she came across him in one of the drawing rooms. Lord Hubert takes me into supper. Poor me! She made an extravagant face of self-pity and swept on. Lord Hubert was one of the sons of the house, a stupid and inarticulate guardsman, Kitty's butt and detestation. Ash smiled to himself over her fate and went back to the ballroom in search of his own lady. Meanwhile, Kitty paused in the next drawing room and dismissed her following. I promised to wait here for Lord Hubert, she said. You go on or you'll get no tables. Then she waved them peremptorily away. The drawing room, one of a suite which looked on the garden, thinned temporarily. In a happy fatigue, Kitty leaned dreamily over the ledge of one of the open windows, looking at the illuminated space below her. Amid the coloured lights, figures of dream and fantasy walked up and down. In the midst flashed a flame-coloured fountain. The sounds of a Strauss waltz floated in the air. And beyond the garden and its trees rose the dull roar of London. A silk curtain floated out into the room under the westerly breeze, then, returning, sheathed Kitty in its folds. She stood there, hidden, amusing herself like a child, with the thought of startling that great heavy goose, Lord Herbert. Suddenly a pair of voices that she knew caught her ear. Two persons, passing through, lingered, without perceiving her. Kitty, after a first movement of self-disclosure, caught her own name and stood motionless. But of course you've heard that we got through, said Lady Parham. For once Lady Kitty behaved herself. You were lucky, said Mary Lister. Lady Tramore was dreadfully anxious. Lest she should cut us at the last, cried Lady Parham. Well, of course, Lady Kitty is capable too. She laughed. But perhaps as you are a cousin, I oughtn't to say these things. Oh, say what you like, said Mary. I'm no friend of Kitty's and never pretended to be. Lady Parham came closer, apparently, and said confidentially, What on earth made that man marry her? He might have married anybody. She had no money, and worse than no position. She worked upon his pity, of course, a good deal. I saw them in the early days at Graceville Park. She played her cards very cleverly. And then it was just the right moment. Lady Tramore had been urging him to marry. Well, of course, said Lady Parham, there's no denying the beauty. You think so? said Mary, as though in wonder. Well, I never could see it, and now she has so much gone off. I don't agree with you. Many people think her the star tonight. Mr. Cliff, I am told, admires her. Kitty could not see how the eyes of the speaker, under a Sir Joshua turban, studied the countenance of Miss Lister as she threw out the words. Mary laughed. Poor oh, Kitty, she tries to flirt with him long ago just after she arrived in London, fresh out of the convent. It was so funny. He told me afterwards he never was so embarrassed in his life, his baby making eyes at him. And now, oh no. Why not now? Lady Kitty's very much the rage, and Mr. Cliff likes notoriety. But a notoriety with, well, with some style, some distinction. Kitty's thought is so cheap and silly. Ah, oh, well, she's not to be despised said Lady Parham. She's as clever as she can be, but her husband will have to keep her in order. Can he? said Mary. Won't she always be in his way? Always, I should think, but he must have known what he was about. Why didn't his mother interfere? Such a family, such a history. She did interfere, said Mary. We all did our best. She dropped her voice. I know I did, but it was no use. If men like spoiled children, they must have them, I suppose. Let's suppose he'll learn how to manage her. Shall we go on? I promised to meet my supper partner in the library. They moved away. For some minutes Kitty stood looking out, motionless, but the beating of her heart choked her. Strange ancestral things, things of evil, things of passion, had suddenly awoke, as it were, from sleep in the depths of her being, and rushed upon the citadel of her life. A change had passed over her from head to foot. Her veins ran fire. At that moment, turning round, she saw Geoffrey Cliff enter the room in which she stood. With an impetuous movement, she approached him. Take me down to supper, Mr. Cliff. I can't wait for Lord Hubert any more, and I'm so hungry. Enchanted, said Cliff, 
the colour leaping into his tanned face as he looked down upon the goddess. But I came to find, Miss Lister, oh, she has gone in with Mr. Darrell. Come with me. I have a ticket for the reserved tent. We shall have a delicious corner to ourselves. And she took from her glove the little coveted pasteboard, which, handed about in secret to a few intimates of the house, gave access to the sanctum sanctorum of the evening. Cliff wavered. Then his vanity succumbed. A few minutes later, the supper guests in the tent of the elite saw the entrance of a darkly splendid Duke of Alba with a little sandaled goddess, all compact, it seemed, of ivory and fire on his arm. End of Part 2 Chapter 10Part 2, Chapter 11 of The Marriage of William Ash by Mary Augusta Ward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evans. Part 2, Chapter 11. The spring freshness of London had long since departed. The crowded season, much animation in Parliament, where the government, to its own amazement, had rather gained than lost ground industrial trouble at home and foreign complications abroad, and in London the steady growth of a new plutocracy, the result, so far, of American wealth and American brides. In the first week of July, the outward things of the moment might have been thus summed up by any careful observer. On a certain Tuesday night, the debate on a private member's bill unexpectedly collapsed, and the House rose early. Ash left the House with his secretary, but parted from him at the corner of Birdcage Walk and crossed the park alone. He meant to join Kitty at a party in Piccadilly. There was just time to go home and dress, and he walked at a quick pace. Two members sitting on the same side of the house with himself were also going home. One of them noticed the under-secretary. A very ineffective statement Ash made tonight, don't you think so? he said to his companion. Eddie! Really, if the government can't take up a stronger line, the general public will begin to think there's something in it. Oh, if you only shriek long enough and sharp enough in England, something's sure to come of it. Cliff and his group have been playing a very shrewd game. The government will get their agreement approved all right, but Cliff has certainly made some people on our side uneasy. However... However what? said the other, after a moment. I wish I thought that were the only reason for Ash's change of tone, said the first speaker, slowly. What do you mean? The two were intimate personal friends, belonging, moreover, to a group of evangelical families well known in English life. But even so, the answer came with reluctance. Well, you see, it's not very easy to grapple in public with a man whose name all smart London happens to be coupling with that of your wife. I say, the other stood still in genuine consternation and distress. You don't mean to say that there's that in it? You notice that the difference is not in what Ash says, but in how he says it. He avoids all personal collision with Cliff. The government stick to their case, but Ash mentions everybody but Cliff, and confutes all arguments but his. And meanwhile, of course, the truth is that Cliff is the head and front of the campaign, and if he threw up tomorrow, everything would quiet down. And Lady Kitty is flirting with him at this particular moment? Damn bad taste and bad feeling, to say the least of it. You won't find one of the Bristol lot consider that kind of thing when their blood is up, said the other. You remember the tales of old Lord Blackwater? But is there really any truth in it, or is it mere gossip? Well, I hear that the behaviour of both of them at Graceville Park last week was such that Lady Graceville vows she would never ask either of them again. And at Ascot, at Lord's, the opera... Lady Kitty sits with him, talks with him, walks with him, the whole time, and won't look at anyone else. They must be asked together, or neither will come. And society, as far as I can make out, thinks it is a good joke, and is always making plans to throw them together. Can't Lady Tramwell do anything? I don't know. They say she is very unhappy about it. Certainly she looks ill and depressed. And Ash? His companion hesitated. I don't like to say it, but, of course, you know, there are many people who would tell you that Ash doesn't care tuppence what his wife does, so long as she is nice to him. 
and he can read his books and carry on his politics as he pleases. Ash always strikes me as the soul of honour, said the other indignantly. Of course, for himself. But a more faithless believer in liberty than Ash doesn't exist. Liberty, especially to damn yourself, if you must and will. It would be hard to extend that doctrine to a wife, said the other, with a grave, uncomfortable laugh. Meanwhile, the man whose affairs they had been discussing walked home, wrapped in solitary and disagreeable thought. As he neared the Marlborough House corner, a carriage passed him. It was delayed a moment by other carriages, and as it halted beside him, Ash recognised Lady M, the hostess of the fancy ball, and a very old friend of his parents. He took her his hat. The lady within recognised him and inclined slightly, very slightly, and stiffly. Ash started a little, and walked on. The meeting vividly recalled the ball. The terminus of crow, indeed, from which the meditation in which he had been plunged since entering the park, had started. Between six and seven weeks ago, was it? It might have been a century. He thought of Kitty as she was that night. Kitty pirouetting in her glittering dress, or bending over the boy, or holding her face to his as he kissed her on the stairs. Never since had she shown him the smallest glimpse of such a mood. But what was wrong with her and with himself? Something since May had turned their life topsy-turvy, and it seemed to Ash that in the general unprofitable rush of futile engagements, he never yet had time to stop and ask himself what it might be. Why, at any rate, was he in this chafing irritation and discomfort? Why could he not deal with that fellow Cliff as he deserved? And what in heaven's name was the reason why old friends like Lady M were beginning to look at him coldly and avoid his conversation? His mother, too. He gathered that quite lately there had been some disagreeable scene between her and Kitty. Kitty had resented some remonstrance of hers, and for some days now they had not met. Nor had Ash seen his mother alone. Did she always avoid him, shrink from speaking out her real mind to him? Well, it was all monstrously absurd. A great coil about nothing, as far as the main facts were concerned. Although the annoyance and worry of the thing were indeed becoming serious. Kitty had no doubt taken a wild liking to Geoffrey Cliff. And by George, said Ash, pausing in his walk, she warned me. And there rose in his memory the formal garden at Graceful Park, the little figure at his side, and Kitty's practices. I should take mad fancies for people. I shan't be able to help it. I have one now from Geoffrey Cliff. He smiled. There was the difficulty. If only the people whose envious tongues were now wagging could see Kitty as she was, could understand what a gulf lay between her and the ordinary fast woman, there would be an end of this silly, ill-natured talk. Other women might be of the earth earthy. Kitty was a sprite with all the irresponsibility of such incalculable creatures. The men and women, women especially, who gossiped and lied about her, who sent abominable paragraphs to scurrilous newspapers. He had one in his pocket which had reached him at the house from an anonymous correspondent. Spoke out of their own vile experience, judged her by their own standards. His mother, at any rate, he proudly thought, ought to know better than to be misled by them for a moment. At the same time, something must be done. It could not be denied that Kitty had been behaving like a romantic, excitable child with this unscrupulous man, whose record with regards to women was probably wholly unknown to her, however foolishly she might idealise the liaison commemorated in his poems. What had Kitty indeed been doing with herself this six weeks? Ash tried to recall them in detail. Ascot, Lords, innumerable parties in London and in the country, to some of which he had not been able to accompany her, owing to the stress of parliamentary and official work. Graceful Park, for instance. He'd been stopped at the last moment from going down there by the arrival of some important foreign news, and Kitty had gone alone. She had reappeared on the Monday, pale and furious, saying that she and her aunt had quarrelled and that she would never go near the Grosfields either in town or country again. She had not volunteered any further explanation, and Ash had refrained from inquiry. There were in him certain disgusts and disdains, belonging to his general epicurean conception of existence, 
which not even his love for Kitty could overcome. One was a disdain for the quarrels of women. He supposed they were inevitable. He saw by the by that Kitty and Lady Parham were once more at daggers drawn. And Kitty seemed to enjoy it. Well, it was her own affair. But while there was a Greek play or a Shakespeare sonnet or even a blue book to read, who could expect him to listen? What had old Lady Graceful been about? He understood that Cliff had been of the party, and Kitty must have done something to bring down upon her the wrath of the puritanical mistress of the house. Well, what was he to do? It was now July. The session would last certainly till the middle of August, and though the American business would be disposed of directly, there was fresh trouble in the Balkan Peninsula and an anxious situation in Egypt. Impossible that he should think of leaving his post. And as for the chance of a dissolution, the government was now a good deal stronger than it had been before Deesta. Worse luck. Of course he ought to take Kitty away. But short of resignation, how was it to be done? And what even would resignation do, supposing, per impossibile, it could be thought of, but give to gnawing gossip a bigger bone, and probably irritate Kitty to the point of rebellion? Yet how induce her to go with anyone else? Lady Tramwell was out of the question. Margaret French, perhaps. Then suddenly Ash was assailed by an inner laughter, hollow and discomfortable. Things were coming to a pretty pass when he must even dream of resigning, because a man whom he despised would haunt his house and absorb the company of his wife, when, moreover, he could not even think of a remedy for such a state of things without falling back dismayed from the certainty of Kitty's temper, Kitty's wild and furious temper. For, during the last fortnight, as it seems to Ash, all the winds of tempest had been blowing through his house. Himself, servants, even Margaret, even the child, had all suffered. He also had lost his temper several times. Such a thing had scarcely happened to him since his childhood. He thought of it as of a kind of physical stain or weakness. To keep an even and stoical mind, to laugh where one could not conquer, this had always seemed to him the first condition of decent existence. And now, to be wrangling over an expenditure, an engagement, a letter, and there is nothing, whether it was a fine day or what it wasn't. Could anything be more petty, degrading, intolerable? He vowed that this should stop. Whatever happened, he and Kitty should not degenerate into a pair of skulls, besmirch their life with corals as ugly as they were silly. He would wrestle with her, his beloved, unreasonable, foolish Kitty, he ought, of course, to have done so before. But it was only within the last week or so that the horizon had suddenly darkened, the thing grown serious. And now this beastly paragraph. But, after all, what did such garbage matter? It would, of course, be a comfort to thrash the editor. But our modern life breeds such creatures, and they have to be born. He let himself into a silent house. His letters lay on the hall table. Among them was a handwriting which arrested him. He remembered, yet could not put a name to it. Then he turned the envelope. Hmm. Lady Graceville. He read it, standing there, then thrust it into his pocket, thinking angrily that there seemed to be a good many fools in this world who occupy themselves with other people's business. Exaggeration, of course. Damnable party pri. When did she ever see Kitty except with a jaundiced eye? I wonder Kitty condescends to go to the woman's house. She must know that everything she does is to seem there en noir. Pharisaical, narrow-minded Philistines. The letter acted as a tonic. Ash was positively grateful to the old Gorgon who wrote it. He ran upstairs, his pulses tingling in defence of Kitty. He would show Lady Graceful that she could not write to him at any rate in that strain with impunity. He took a candle from the landing and opened his wife's door in order to pass through her room to his own. As he did so, he ran against Kitty's maid, Blanche, who was coming out. She shrank back as she saw him, but not before the light of his candle had shone full upon her. Her face was disfigured with tears, which were indeed still running down her cheeks. "'Why, Blanche!' 
he said, standing still, then in the kind voice which endeared him to the servants, I am afraid your brother is worse? For the poor brother in hospital passed through many vicissitudes since his operation, and the little maid's spirits have fluctuated accordingly. Oh, no, sir, no, sir, said Blanche, drying her eyes, and retreating into the shadows of the room where only a faint flame of gas was burning. It's not that, sir, thank you. I was just putting away her ladyship's things, she said inconsequently, looking round the room. That was hardly what caused the tears, was it? said Ash, smiling. Is there anything with which Lady Kitty or I could help you? The girl, who had always seemed to him on excellent terms with Kitty, gave a sudden sob. Thank you, sir. I've just given her ladyship warning. Indeed, said Ash gravely. I'm sorry for that. I thought you'd got on here very well. Oh, I used to, sir, but this last few weeks um, nothing pleases her ladyship. You can't do anything right. I'm sure I've worked my hands off. But I can't do any more. Perhaps her ladyship will find someone else to suit her better. Didn't her ladyship try to persuade you to stay? Yes, but I gave warning once before, and then I stayed, and it's it's no good. It seems if you must do wrong. And I don't sleep, sir. It gets on your nerves, sir. But I didn't mean to complain. Good night, sir. Good night. Don't sit up for your mistress. You look tired out. I'll help her. Thank you, sir said the maid in a depressed voice, and went. Half an hour later, Ash mounted the staircase of a well-known house in Piccadilly. The evening party was beginning to thin, but in a side drawing-room a fine Austrian band was playing Strauss, and some of the intimates of the house were dancing. Ash at once perceived his wife. She was dancing with a clever Cambridge lad, a cousin of Madeleine Alcott's, who had long been one of her adorers and so charming with the spectacle, so exhilarating with the youth and beauty of the pair, that Ash presently suspected what was indeed the truth, that most of the persons gathered in the room were there to watch Kitty dance, rather than to dance themselves. He himself watched her, though he professed to be talking to his hostess, a woman of middle age with honest eyes and a brow of command. "'It is a delight to see Lady Kitty dance,' she said to him, smiling. "'But she is tired. I am sure she wants the country.' "'Like my boy,' said Ash. "'I wish to goodness they both go.' "'Oh, I know it's hard to leave the husband toiling in town,' said his companion, "'who, as the daughter, wife, and mother of politicians, "'had had a long experience of official life.' "'Ash glanced at her, at her face moulded by kind and scrupulous living, "'with a sudden relief of tension. "'Clearly no gossip had reached her.' He lingered beside her, for the sheer pleasure of talking to her. But their tete-a-tete -tete was soon interrupted by the approach of Lady Parham with a daughter, a slim and silent girl to whom it was whispered her mother was giving a last chance of this season, before sending her into the country as a failure, and bringing out her younger sister. Lady Parham greeted the hostess with effusion. It was a rich house and these small, informal dances were said to be more helpful to matrimonial development than larger affairs. Then she perceived Ash, and her whole manner changed. There was a very evident bristling, and she gave him a greeting deliberately careless. Confound the woman, thought Ash, and his own pride rose. Working as hard as usual, Lady Parham? he asked her with a smile. If you like to put it so, was the stiff reply. There is, of course, a good deal of going out. I hope, if I may say so, you don't allow Lord Parham to do too much of it. Lord Parham never was better in his life, said Lord Parham's spouse, with the air of putting down an impertinence. That's good news. I must say, when I saw him this afternoon, I thought he seemed to be feeling his work a good deal. Oh, he's worried, said Lady Parham sharply. Worried about a good many things. She turned suddenly and looked at her companion, an insolent and deliberate look. "'Ah, that's where the wives come in,' replied Ash, unperturbed. "'Look at Mrs. Lorraine. She has the art to perfection, hasn't she? The way she cushions Lorraine is something wonderful to see.' Lady Parham flushed angrily. The suggested comparison between herself and that incessant rattle and blare of social event through which she dragged her husband conducting thereby a vulgar campaign of her own, 
as arduous as his and far more ambitious, and the ways and character of gentle Mrs. Lorraine, absorbed in the man she adored, scatterbrained and absent-minded towards the rest of the world, but for him all eyes and ears, an angel of shelter and protection. This did not now reach the Prime Minister's wife for the first time. But she had no opportunity to launch a retort, even supposing she had one ready, for the music ceased and the tide of dancers surged towards the doors. It brought Kitty abruptly face to face with Lady Parham. Oh, how do you do? said Kitty, in a tone that was already an offence, and she held out a small hand with an indescribably regal air. Lady Parham just touched it, glanced at the owner from top to toe, and walked away. Kitty slipped in beside Ash for a moment with her back to the wall, laughing and breathless. I say, Kitty, said Ash, bending over her and speaking in her small ear, I thought Lady Parham was eternally obliged to us. What's wrong with her? Only that I can't stand her, said Kitty. What's the good of trying? She looked up, a flame of mutiny in her cheeks. What indeed, said Ash, feeling as reckless as she. Her manners are beyond the bounds. But look here, Kitty, don't you think you'll come home? You know, you do look uncommonly tired. Kitty frowned. Home? Why, I'm only just beginning to enjoy myself. Take me into the cool, please, she said to the boy who had been dancing with her, and who still hovered near, in case his divinity might allow him yet a few more minutes. But as she put out her hand to take his arm, Ash saw her waver, and look suddenly across the room. A group parted that had been clustering round a farther door, and Ash perceived Cliff, leaning against the doorway with his arms crossed. He was surrounded by pretty women, with whom he seemed to be carrying on a bantering warfare. Involuntarily, Ash watched for the recognition between him and Kitty. Did Kitty's lips move? Was there a signal? If so, it passed like a flash. Kitty hurried away, and Ash was left, haughtily furious with himself, that for the first time in his life he had played the spy. He turned in his discomfort to leave the dancing room. He himself enjoyed society, frankly enough. Especially since his marriage had he found the companionship of agreeable women delightful. He went instinctively to seek it and drive out this nonsense from his mind. Just inside the larger drawing room, however, he came across Mary Lister, sitting in a corner, apparently alone. Mary greeted him, but with an evident coldness. Her manner brought back all the preoccupations of his walk from the house. In spite of her small cordiality, he sat down beside her, wondering with a vicarious compunction at what point her fortunes might be, and how Kitty's proceedings might have already affected them. But he had not yet succeeded in thawing her, when a voice behind him said, "'This is my dance, I think, Miss Lister. Where shall we sit it out?' Ash moved at once. Mary looked up, hesitated visibly, then rose and took Geoffrey Cliff's arm. "'Just read your remarks this evening,' said Cliff to Ash. "'Well, no, I suppose tomorrow we'll see your ship in port.' Well, it was reasonably expected that the morrow would see the American agreement ratified by a substantial ministerial majority. "'Certainly, but you may at least reflect that you have lost us a deal of time.' "'And now you slay us.' said Cliff. Oh, well, Dutch, decorum, etc. Don't imagine that you'll get many of the honours of martyrdom, laughed Ash. In Cliff's eyes an offensive and triumphant figure, as he leaned carelessly upon a marble pedestal that carried a bust of Horace Walpole. Why? Cliff's hand had gone instinctively to his moustache. Mary had dropped his arm and now stood quietly beside him, pale and somewhat jaded, her fine eyes travelling between the speakers. Why? Because the heresies have no martyrs. The halo is for the true church. Ah, said Cliff, with a reflective sneer. I suppose you mean for the successful. Do I? said Ash, with nonchalance. Aren't the true church the people who are justified by the event? The orthodox like to think so, said Cliff, but the heretics have a way of coming out top. Does that mean you chaps are going to win at the next election? I devoutly hope you may. We are all as stale as ditchwater, and as for places, anybody's welcome to mine. And so saying, 
Ash lounged away, attracted by the bow and smile of a pretty Frenchwoman, with whom it was always agreeable to chat. "'Ash trifles it as usual,' said Cliff, as he and Mary forced a passage into one of the smaller rooms. "'Is there anything in the world that he really cares about?' Mary looked at him with a start. It was almost on her lips to say, "'Yes, his wife.' She only just succeeded in driving the words back. "'His not caring is a pretense,' she said. "'At least Lady Dranmore thinks so. "'She believes that he is becoming absorbed in politics "'much more ambitious than she ever thought he would be.' "'That's the way of mothers,' said Cliff with a sarcastic lip. "'They've got to make the best of their sons. "'Tell me what you're going to do this summer.' "'He'd thrown one arm round the back of a chair "'and sat looking down upon her, "'his colourless fair hair falling thick upon his brow, "'and giving by contrast a strange inhuman force "'to the dark and singular eyes beneath. "'He had a way of commanding a woman's attention "'by flashes of brusquerie, "'melting when he chose into a homage "'that had in it the note of an older world, "'a world that had still leisure for passion and its refinements, "'a world still within sight of that other "'which had produced the carte du tendre. "'Perhaps it was this, combined with the virilities not to be questioned, of his aspect, the signs of hard physical endurance in the face burned by desert suns, and the suggestions of a frame too lean and gaunt for drawing-rooms, that gave him his spell, and preserved it. Mary's conversation with him consisted at first of much cool fencing on her part, which gradually slipped back, as he intended it should, into some of the tones of intimacy. Each, meanwhile, was conscious of a secret range of thoughts, hers concerned with the effort and struggle, the bitter disappointments and disillusions of the past six weeks, and his with the schemes he had cherished in the East and on the way home of marrying Mary Lister, or more correctly Mary Lister's money, and so resigning himself to the inevitable boredoms of an English existence. For her, the mental horizon was full of Kitty, Kitty insolent, Kitty triumphant. For him, too, Kitty made the background of thought, environed, however, with clouds of indecision and resistance that would have raised happiness in Mary, could she have divined them. For he was now not easy to capture. There had been enough, and more than enough, of women in his life. The game of politics must somehow replace them henceforth, if indeed anything was still worth while except the long day in the saddle and the dawn of new mornings in untrodden lands. Mingled, all these, with hot dislike of Ash, with the fascination of Kitty, and a kind of venomous pleasure in the commotion produced by his pursuit of her. Interpenetrated, moreover, through and through with the memory of his one true feeling, and of the woman who had died, alienated from and despising him. He and Mary passed a profitless half-hour. He would have liked to propitiate her, but he had no notion what he should do with the propitiation if it were reached. He wanted her money, but he was beginning to feel with restlessness that he could not pay the cost. The poet in him was still strong, crossed though it were by this venturer. He took her back to the dancing room. Mary walked beside him with a dull, fierce sense of wrong. It was Kitty, of course, who had done it. Kitty, who had taken him away from her. That's finished, said Cliff to himself, with a long breath of relief as he delivered her into the hands of her partner. Now for the other. Thenceforward, no one saw Kitty, and no one danced with her. She spent her time in beflowered corners or remote drawing-rooms with Geoffrey Cliff. Ash heard her voice in the distance once or twice, answering a voice he detested. He looked into the supper-room with a lady on his arm, and across it he saw Kitty, with her white elbow on the table and her hand propping a face that was turned, half mocking and yet wholly absorbed, to Cliff. He saw her flitting across vistas or disappearing through far doorways, but always with that sinister figure in attendance. His mind was divided between a secret fury roused in him by the pride of a man of high birth and position who has always had the world at command and now sees an impertinence offered him which he does not know how to punish, and a mood of irony. 
Tiff's persecution of Kitty was a piece of confounded bad manners. But to look at it with the round, hypocritical eyes some of these people were bringing to bear on it was really too much. Let them look to their own affairs. They needed it. At last, the party broke up. Kitty touched him on the shoulder as he was standing on the stairs, apparently absorbed in a teasing skirmish with a charming child in her first season, who thought him the most delightful of men. I'm ready, William. He turned sharply and saw that she was alone. Come along, then. In five minutes more I should have been asleep on the stairs. They descended. Kitty went for her cloak. Ash sent for the carriage. As he was standing on the steps, Cliff pushed past him and called for a hansom. It came in the rear of two or three carriages already under the portico. He ran along the pavement and jumped in. The doors were just being shut by the linkman, when a little figure in a white cloak flew down the steps of the house and held up a hand to the driver of the hansom. "'Do you see that?' said Lady Parham, in a voice of suppressed but contemptuous amazement, as she turned to Mary Lister, who was driving home with her. "'Call my carriage, please,' he said imperiously to one of the footmen at the door. Her carriage, as it happened, was immediately behind the hansom, but the hansom could not move because of the small lady who had jumped upon the step and was leaning eagerly forward. There was a clamour of shouting voices. "'Move on, cabby, move on!' "'Stand clear, ma'am, please,' said the driver, while Cliff opened the door of the cab and seemed about to jump down again. "'Who is it?' said an impatient judge behind Lady Parham. What's the matter? Lady Parham shrugged her shoulders. It's Lady Kitty Ash, whispered the debutante who was the judge's daughter, talking to Mr. Cliff. Isn't she pretty? A sudden silence fell upon the group in the porch. Kitty's high, clear laugh seemed to ring back into the house. Then Ash ran down the steps. Kitty, don't stop the way. He peremptorily drew her back. Cliff raised his hat, fell back into the hansom, and the man whipped up the horse. Kitty came back into the outer hall with Ash. Her cheeks had a rose flush, her wild eyes laughed at the crowd on the steps, without really seeing them. "'Are you going with Lady Parham?' she said absently to the Mary Lister. "'Yes.' Kitty looked up, and Ash saw the two faces as she and Mary confronted each other, the contempt in Mary's a startled wrath in Kitty's. "'Come, Miss Lister,' said Lady Parham, and pushing past the ashes without a good night, she hurried to her carriage, drawing up the glass with a hasty hand, though the night was balmy. For a few moments none of those left on the steps spoke, except to fret in undertones for an absent carriage. Then Ash saw his own groom and stormed at him for delay. In another minute he and Kitty were in the carriage, and the figures under the porch dropped out of sight. "'Better not do that again, Kitty, I think,' said Ash. Kitty glanced at him, but both voice and manner were as usual. "'Why shouldn't I?' she said haughtily. He saw that she grew very white. "'I was telling Geoffrey where to find me at Lord's.' Ash winced at the archangelism of the Christian name. "'You kept Lady Parham waiting.' "'What does that matter?' said Kitty, with an angry laugh. "'And you did Cliff too much honour, said Ash. "'It's the men who should stand on the steps, not the women.' Kitty sat erect. "'What do you mean?' she said, in a low, menacing voice. And "'Just what I say,' was the laughing reply. Kitty threw herself back in her corner and could not be induced to open her lips or look at her companion till they reached home. On the landing, however, outside her bedroom, she turned and said, Don't please say impertinent things to me again. And, drawn up to her full height, the most childish and obstinate of tragedy queens, she swept into her room. Ash went into his dressing room, and almost immediately afterwards he heard the key turn in the lock which separated his room from Kitty's. For the first time since their marriage, he threw himself on his bed and passed some sleepless hours. Then fatigue had its way. When he awoke, there was a grey dawn in the room, and he was conscious of something pressing against his bed. Half asleep, he raised himself and saw Kitty in a long white dressing gown, sitting curled up on the floor, 
or rather on a pillow, her head resting on the edge of the bed. In a glass opposite, he saw the languid grace of her slight form and the cloud of her hair. Kitty! He tried to shake himself into full consciousness. Do go to bed. Lie down, said Kitty, lifting her arm and pressing him down, and don't say anything. I shall go to sleep. He lay down immediately. Presently he felt that her cheek was resting on one of his hands, and in his semi-consciousness he laid the other on her hair. Then they both fell asleep. His dreams were a medley of the fancy ball and of some pageant scene in which Irish and Ceres appeared, and there was a rustic dance of maidens and shepherds. Then a murmur as of thunder ran through the scene, followed by darkness. He half woke in a hot distress, but the soft cheek was still there, his hand still felt the silky curls, and sleep recaptured him. End of part two, chapter eleven.